make them really, really good at one thing. And it might not include every single, every single feature that our customers might want, but may better be really good at one thing. Hey, my name is Felix Tia, and I'm the host of Shopify Masters, a weekly podcast powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, and anywhere in between. Each week, we invite entrepreneurs like you to share what they've learned growing successful e-commerce businesses. In this episode, you'll learn how to create and sell starter kits in your industry, what it means to create a focused product, and why you should toss out good ideas. Today, I'm joined by Spencer Borup from Magmod. Magmod designs sleek, portable, and durable flash modifiers for amateur professional photographers and was started in 2013 and based out of Tucson, Arizona. Welcome, Spencer. Hey, Felix. How are you? Good, good. So for us uninitiated, what is the, the Magmod and how does it work? Well, Magmod, everything we do is all about making awesome photography easy. And uh, I was a photographer for about seven or eight years professionally and used all sorts of different accessories that would attach to a flash to uh, allow us to kind of modify and shape the light how we wanted to. And a lot of those accessories were just kind of boring or they just didn't work very well. They would fall off. And uh, one day I had an idea and, and that's where Magma was born, making the system of these modifiers more magnetic and modular and just super easy to do. And so that's kind of where Magma started was making this magnetic modular flash modifiers for photographers. Got it. So you have um, on your website now, you have uh, multiple different products. You've also had multiple Kickstarter, successful Kickstarter campaigns. Uh, w- w- which product of yours you, would you say is probably the best selling and why do you think that is? Uh, one of the single best selling products is probably the MagSphere. And uh, the reason that's probably the most popular is is a lot of photographers are really looking to take their small speed light flashes. These are the kind of the, the Cobra shaped flashes that go on top of a camera. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're, they're looking to make the light a little more pleasing and they don't want to think about it too much. You know, they can rotate in different angles and bounce off the wall or the ceiling. Um, and sometimes that's just, just not enough. And so what we did with the mag sphere is not only did we simplify it by making the attachment method super easy with magnets, we also introduced some some features that had never been seen before in a diffuser like this for a flash, such as being able to add gels into the base of the mag sphere to adjust the color, temperature, hue, or density of your flash, which is something very new. And then you could stack it with a, a mag grid, one of our next most popular products, to then restrict the light into just a specific area while still retaining that incredible softness. So the mm-hmm. MagSphere is super popular. As soon as we launched it, it was kind of one instantly one of our best sellers. Uh, but we do have some kits that we uh, started making available to uh, retail stores like Best Buy back in September. Uh, so the starter kit includes those two products I mentioned, the MagSphere and the MagGrid, and you can get those uh, in, in a small kit for a pretty good price. Yeah, I've I've seen other uh, entrepreneurs, other companies starting to create these these kits of uh, of products, uh, particularly for for beginners who that are they're looking to just get started. And like you said, you have a starter kit that you put you put out now. What was the genesis behind that? What made you decide that this was something you wanted to do? Yeah, so when we launched the company at the end of 2013, I had kind of three products in mind. One of them was that mag grid, but we also had a mag gel. And so what I was kind of testing in the marketplace was uh, not necessarily new modification abilities, but the the ease and speed of these tools. And so the grid and the gel, uh, this new magnetic mounting and modular system really kicked off right away. And so that was kind of our basic kit, which is actually the name of the product on the website. The MagMod basic kit includes the magnetic mount, our grip, we got the gel and the mag grid. And those were always kind of the really strong uh, set of tools that we would recommend to every photographer for every flash that they would normally shoot with. And then when we were announced uh, a second Kickstarter campaign introducing the mag sphere, the mag bounce, and the mag snoot, uh, we offered kind of a really big bundle, which we called kind of the complete kit. And that did really well. But uh, over the years, we found that people wanted maybe to test the waters a little bit simpler. And we didn't have a bundle other than the complete kit that had that mag sphere, that top selling product. So eventually, uh, you know, a big retailer, Best Buy, 
came uh, came around. They actually came out to us and, and said, hey, we really like what we see. A lot of people are asking about the product. And I said, well, that, that's great. I don't think the current configuration of our bundles, our merchandising, would be ideal for a Best Buy customer. And so that's when we actually started the starter kit and the professional kit. And uh, those those kind of came out early last year in our or sorry, late last year, and are currently our two kind of best-selling kits. People that want to test the waters that are unsure of whether or not these are going to solve the problems that they have, and then almost always they come back looking for to kind of round out the kit of accessories that they need. Yeah, so you you sell this through through Best Buy, and of course also I see them featured on on your site. Do you have to sell based on your experience? Do you have to sell the kits differently? Do you have to market them differently than you would the individual products? No, not really. We haven't we haven't seen a need to uh, to market them any differently. Usually, when people hear about the brand, um, it's usually through word of mouth, another photographer, a friend of theirs, or an online forum or on Facebook, and then they'll jump onto our website and they'll kind of see, oh, what is what is MagMod really all about? Do they really solve a problem that I have as a photographer? And so, as they jump in and start to see the value that we offer, the really fast, easy, and awesome system. Um, it then kind of almost sells itself. And I, I'm a firm believer in any product really needs to sell itself. And once they see it, they can kind of pick and choose, all right, which components do I think um, are going to best suit my needs? And oftentimes they're going to see a bundle or a package that that they see that is probably most in tune um, to give them a little bit of savings in a bundle format, but also gives them kind of exactly what they need. And so we have five different bundles, but those first two, the starter kit and the, and the professional kit, um, are t- send, tend to be the ones people are gravitating towards right mm-hmm. now. So do you find that new customers will typically buy kit uh, rather than an, an individual item at first, or is it the other way where they start off with a, buying one item and then upgrading to a kit? Um, we've seen it go both ways. Lately, I think it's people jumping in with a bundle um, just because it makes it easier. Bundles are, are great uh, for customers because it kind of uh, eliminates some of that thinking, that analysis to, to decide which ones do I need and which ones do I don't need. And so when you kind of bundle them together with our kind of curated knowledge, almost all of us here are photographers, we're very experienced in the industry. We know what true, really good lighting looks like. And so we give our recommendation. If, if you're doing this kind of photography, we'd recommend this bundle. Or if you're doing this kind of photography and you have this number of flashes, we'd recommend this one. So uh, people appreciate kind of that uh, insider knowledge as photographers that we can offer that that helps them kind of make that decision. But we also see people coming in and just getting one of our modifiers just to test it out. And then uh, a lot of them, you know, the majority of them come back. And, and we see that a lot at trade shows as well. Uh, you know, we package them in, in a very similar way as we do on the website. They'll come in and get something basic or they'll kind of get our wedding kit, which is probably our next most popular bundle. Um, and then they'll come back and just get different gels um, or try the new MagBeam, one of our products that uh, allows some really cool customization of your light. Um, and then eventually a lot of people will end up with the entire family of the system. That's cool. So when these uh, bundles are created, it sounds like most of you guys are photographers, so you can intuitively know what needs to go together. Have there been bundles that have come out of feedback or just uh data, I guess, that you've seen from the community and from the customers that you start realizing that certain things uh, are bought together or maybe customers reaching out asking you to put together a specific bundle. Has it come that way? Oh, yeah, totally. We uh, we had that complete kit, like I mentioned previously, which uh, I guess was early 2015 uh, when we started shipping those products. And then after that, we definitely went to our customers and, and asked, you know, which which are your favorites? Which would you like to see in a bundle? And uh, kind of later that summer, we introduced some of our, our bundles on the website. And uh, the most popular one, the, the wedding uh, photographer bundle, came out and has kind of continued to be a bestseller. Um, for someone who wants to come in and just get everything, they've, they've heard about it or they've tried it with, you know, a friend on a, on a wedding shoot and they were kind of assisting or something, and they've tried it out themselves. We see a lot of people jumping in right away with the Mega Kit, which is basically one of everything uh, but a setup for two flashes. So if you're a wedding photographer, event portrait, or family portrait photographer, and uh, you ha- you're using more than one flash on one of your portrait sessions, 
um, you know, the, any of our top bundles are designed to outfit two flashes. And so that feedback came directly mm-hmm. from our community. And, and same with the starter in the professional bundle that uh, we introduced first at Best Buy. We, we went to our community, our Facebook community, with over, you know, 35,000 members or something. And, uh, and we asked them, you know, what would you like to see in some kind of base, more basic configurations? And that's where those came from. Got it. And have you uh, played around with the kind of discounts that you would uh, include in a bundle if someone bought it in, in a package? Like, what kind of recommendations do you have there in terms of offering some kind of savings to customers when things are bundled together? Yeah, like I had mentioned, bundles really kind of eliminate some of that analysis. You don't want a customer coming to a website and seeing kind of a grid of 20 or 100 different products, you know, they really appreciate some of that curated um, expertise. And so when you can make that decision easier and then you can take off, you know, two or three or five percent, then that kind of becomes a no brainer because everyone is, is, is somewhat incentivized by by price. Mm-hmm. A lot of people want the value with the with, with the kind of uh, discounted price. And so if you can give them that whole value, what they're looking for. And then incentivize it with a small discount. You know that that works really well in e-commerce. Got it. So I guess what you're saying is that the, the biggest benefit for the bundle to the bundle for the customer is just to remove that analysis paralysis and make it uh, easier for them to make a decision on what to purchase. Absolutely, yeah. We see it. We see it all the time. Got it. Now, these these all sound like great things, right? With uh, creating a bundle, are there any disadvantages, whether it be in the sales or revenue or operations or administration, with offering bundles uh, in your catalog? Um, no, it really depends on how you actually fulfill the bundles in the in the beginning, kind of that 2015 time. Um, we kind of, we, they were kind of virtual bundles. We didn't actually have them physically packaged in one box, but uh, we would send the order information to our fulfillment partner and they would take the five or six SKUs and, and just package them and, and ship them off as the individual SKUs. Um, and so when we introduced the starter kit and the pro kit, that actually simplifies the fulfillment, the administration, um, the assembly, all that kind of stuff, because now it was all in one, in one package. And so the, the pro kit combined kind of four of our top products and I put them into one physical package. And so that, that reduces your fulfillment costs, reduces your shipping costs, it reduces kind of some of your packaging costs as well. And so that actually simplified it for us, which, you know, in the end is going to drive your bottom line. Uh, the, you know, every dollar counts in, uh, in your margin. So, yeah, that really just simplified things for us quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing you're mentioning earlier, and you also mentioned uh, to us uh, in the pre-interview, was about making unique and focused products because that's necessary in order to have a product that sells itself. So I think the uniqueness makes sense. I think you explained about how you're you are a different than, than the competitors. What does it mean to you to create a, a focused product? What does that mean? To me, a, a focused product is really focused on solving a real problem. And that's something when when I was a photographer, you know, I wanted to be the best in my marketplace and I wanted it to be apparent that if someone came on my website or was browsing my social media channels, that they saw something different and I didn't have to market myself through words or through video or, or something and trying to convince them, here's why working with me would 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 be better. And uh, so I, I learned a lot kind of running that solopreneur business. I, you know, I, was, I was the only person in the business. Mm-hmm. And then when I started MagMod, it was really, I don't want to necessarily need to convince people by just talking to them that they should buy my product. Hopefully that's just apparent when they land on the website and they see the features, they see the design and they see the value that it offers. It just it makes it that much easier. So the more focused you get on solving a real legitimate problem, I think it, the easier it is to, to kind of grow a brand because people will then come to you knowing that, oh, he solved my problem in this way and uh, I really I really like the way that they did that. I'm likely going to gonna gravitate towards other products that they offer in the future. That makes a lot of sense. I like that you're saying solve a real problem 
because the opposite of that, I think what you're saying is that you don't want to sort of solve a problem and then try to convince people that it is actually a problem that they have, which makes it a much more uphill battle in terms of how to market and sell that product. Now, how do you actually demonstrate that on your website or in your marketing? How do you actually demonstrate that this is the problem that you're solving and how you're solving it? Well, photographers are very visual people and, um, you know, we, the best way we do it on the website is through video. And so when you land on our homepage, we have kind of a background header image. That's, that's just a scrolling video that's showing photographers using the product, uh, in a very intuitive way. And so if you were a photographer who was looking for this type of product, you would instantly start seeing someone using the product and showing how easy it is to use. But one of the best ways that we sell it um, is actually in person. And uh, so at a trade show, we have our, our booth designed in such a way where people can interact with the product as if they were almost uh, walking up to you know, a photo shoot. Here's, here's their flash. How are they going to set it up? And they can actually play with the products and put them on a flash. And once they do that, it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. I wish we, would, we had the capability – of, uh, of just mm-hmm. kind of having a candid camera, f- you know, filming these people doing it because their eyes light up that first second that they put it on. They're like, whoa, that was so easy. And then you see the gears turning when they start kind of stacking them together, that modular effect that we designed. And they're just like, whoa, this is unlike anything else I've tried. And, and they realize how easy it is. And then they see the price. They're like, oh, that's it. And <laughs> it's, you know, there's they're kind of that one-two punch. They're sold right away. And that's, that's a struggle that we find to do on the website, and which is why we've done a lot of video. And uh, so the more videos we have showing how easy it is and showing the results that you can get from using our products has, uh, has been one of the most effective ways to demonstrate the value that the products offer. Yeah, that makes sense that that you want to be able to show them the before and after. This is what your life is like before and now with the MagMod, this is how it can be improved. And you mentioned that with uh, when people look at the price, they're like, wow, that's it. I think that 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 reaction can sometimes be different between the people that are buying it that are amateurs versus professionals that need it for their business. Do you find that that's the case in, in your industry too, where you have the, the pricing or maybe even the marketing is going to be different when you are selling to amateurs versus professional photographers? Uh, it's always going to be different as uh, as people's price sensitivity changes. And so photographers that are professionals are the, are the ones that are working day in and day out and uh, for the most part, you know, these are tools that help them make money. And so it, it's less of, a, of, an, of a, a logical or an emotional thing. It's they see it as if this tool is going to help me do my job better, then it becomes kind of a no brainer. And it's a very small investment. Uh, but it, it's still an investment because the products, if they're durable enough, they're going to last them a few years. Whereas someone that's kind of just getting into photography or, or amateurs that have, that have been in for a while, they're looking to be better photographers. They're, they're less concerned about whether it's going to make them more money or make them look better in front of their clients. They just kind of want to enjoy the process of learning photography and become better. And so they view it definitely in a little bit different way. And so the easier we can show that to the photographers that are professionals – that it's a solid investment, that it's that it's something that they shouldn't need to kind of question because of long-term viability or their durability or how easy it is allows them to do their job easier, then that, that helps them um, decide whether or not they need to buy. For the amateurs or the beginners, if we can show how they can get professional results by using our tools and not because of the tools themselves but because of how easy the tools are to use – and it allows them to get professional results better than they did before, then that becomes a lot easier a way to communicate why they should be purchasing the products. Yeah, that that, that, that makes sense. And I, this is kind of a maybe more of a philosophical question. I think in the in the photography world or even the filmmaking world, there's this idea that, or not idea, but there's um, uh, the community tends to like to acquire gear, right? And other than I think there are other industries the same thing where people just love to buy products, buy tools, buy gear. Why do you think that that is the case specifically with? with your industry and yeah, I guess that's, that's basically the question. Like, why do you think that's the case with your industry where people just like the, the concept of acquiring more gear for, for their, their hobby or for, for their, their job? Yeah, totally. I was, uh, I was, 
I was part of that crowd. I call it uh, gas, the gear acquisition mm-hmm. syndrome. And uh, when I was, you know, an early photographer, really, you know, decide, you know, trying to make my way in it, I'd be, you know, buying and selling different things um, because I was, you know, really interested in improving my craft. And uh, eventually, that process just becomes fun. You like, you know, playing with new toys, new things that allow you to create different types of effect in your photography or your films. And uh, and sometimes it's it's nice to just have more than you need. Because you just don't know that next situation where you would need the tool. And I think a lot of photographers just feel comfort in knowing that if I have it, I'll be able to use it. I don't want to be put in that situation where I could have made this photo. Um, because then you miss out. Then you just, you're kicking yourself because mm-hmm. like, oh, that could have been my favorite shot of this whole month or this quarter. Or this could have been my hero shot. But I didn't have that one thing that would take it to the next level. And, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to, to impress our clients, but we're also trying to get that future business. And if there's that one, that one image or that one reel that we can make that really sets us apart, um, you know, we strive for those things. And if we feel like we're inhibited in that process, then yeah, I think part of that fuels the gear acquisition syndrome. But sometimes I I see a lot of photographers who just, who just love acquiring those things Mm -hmm. and, they love, you know, that, that collection. They love taking right. care of those things and showing them off to their friends. And, um, yeah, there's, you know, I was part of it in the beginning and less so in the end, but you know, it's just fun photography equipment and those kind of gadgets. They're just kind of fun to play with. Mm-hmm. And does that, does that change your, your marketing then where if you are, if you do have a customer that's a collector that just likes playing around with new gear versus someone that is more of like a utilitarian that is buying this specifically because they have a shoot next month and they need it particularly for that reason. Do you, do you, do you find that you need to change, not necessarily change, but do you find that there are more effective ways to communicate to one or the other? No, we've never really, uh, we've never really targeted to kind of that gear acquisition mentality. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's because the the, the features and, and the value and the benefits that our products provide are, are pretty obvious. I mean, if you watch a video, ten seconds of, of a video of us showing how to use them, it becomes pretty obvious when you compare our, uh, what we offer, what Magmon does, to previous competitors. Um, it just kind of clicks right away. And so I think when the, you know, the, the gear heads that love kind of collecting the different tools, they see it, it, it just kind of is no brainer. We don't need to say anything else. We just show them. Um, they're like, wow, all right, I'm sold. Mm-hmm. So one other thing you mentioned to us during the pre-interview was about how you uh, think it's important to learn to enjoy the process of iterating, testing, and failing. What is your, your product development process like? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a good question. It's always being refined. Um, you know, there's there's no easy way to go about uh, creating new products, and uh, that process is is difficult. We're actually uh, in in the middle of getting ready for a new product launch that uh, we've been working on for over two years now. And uh, within the first two years of Magmod's existence, we we basically had almost all of our products that are currently available to date now. Granted, we're only four and a half years old, but we have been working on these new products for just over two years. And uh, that process really is about we, we have an idea about a problem that we would like to solve. It's a, it's a problem that we've experienced ourselves, but we know is a problem our current customers and future customers are likely experiencing now. And we have to really get focused on what that problem is. And then we start an- an- analyzing what are all of the things that this product needs to solve for it to be viable? And sometimes that starts with what are the things that we don't need to solve? There's a lot of products that are made today, um, not just in the photography world, but most consumer products today are, are just about how do we jam pack features into it and just give them all the features that are possible. And because of that, you don't have one feature that's maybe the best at, at what it does. And so that's really what I've been mostly interested in. The very beginning of of my desire to make products was make them really, really good at one thing. And it might not include every single single feature that our customers might want, but may better be really good at one thing. And so that's where we start is that design phase. 
And then if we can land on what is that one thing that needs, needs to be really, really good, we then move on to how does that interaction look like as the customer? And I think Steve Jobs did said this in, in a podcast, uh, or not a podcast, a, a keynote um, a long time ago. It was pre, I think maybe pre-iPhone, when he talked about how the Silicon Valley, the computer makers, were really more about what are all the features that we can introduce and just put them in. And Steve Jobs was more about you have to start in reverse. You have to start with the the user experience and work backwards into the technology. And don't start with the technology and then develop it into a product. And uh, I didn't necessarily know that at the time or I didn't take it as a driving force, but I've heard it recently um, in the past, you know, six or nine months. And it really rang true to me that you've got to look at the product and how the consumer, the user is going to interact with it and then design around that. Because if you lose focus on what the consumer really wants and how it really needs to be to make it the, the best version of that solution, you have to you have to have that consumer in mind. And once we have that kind of locked down, and uh, I think that's actually something fairly easy for me. Um, that's just kind of my personality and my mind. I, I don't know why I was gifted with this kind of visual ability to see that thing. Um, I guess in the business world, my role would be kind of the visionary. I see those kind of solutions in my head really clearly, and then I can get them out. But then we kind of turn it over to the actual designers and engineers, and they will just iterate. And a good friend of mine, um, I'll give a shout out to Brian. He works at uh, Oculus Rift. He, he, when he was in graduate school, he helped me one of our, with one of our products. And he said, if you're going to fail, fail quickly. And uh, I've taken that as our mantra in our iteration process where we're going to try a new way to do something or change some dimensions or tolerances. And let's go try it. Let's make sure it fails. And if it uh, fails, let's make sure we do it as quick as possible. Because the longer we get to a failure point, the slower it takes to actually release this product. And, and we've experienced that dozens of times in these new products that we're trying to launch, uh, hopefully very soon, within the next, uh, within the next three months, ideally, mm-hmm. is uh, we'll, we'll design something, we'll iterate with 3D printing or other different types of prototyping. We want to see, can we get it to fail in the normal way a user would be using it? And uh, until we get to a point where we stop failing, then we know we're on to something. But then you actually take it to manufacturing and you're using it in the materials it's intended to be used with and the processes that are intended to design with. Um, you have to kind of then be extra scrutinous on every single little detail. And so the reason it's taken so long is that final 10%, the manufacturing process, often is what takes the longest amount of time because, you know, you have physically people making a tool and they're injecting either plastic or rubber or they're casting in metals. And, uh, and, and those things just take time. And so we'll get those parts and we'll test them and they might not fit perfectly and we have to kind of tweak and modify. And, uh, and then you got to wait to see where you can get it to fail. And then you get it to fail and you realize, uh, material that they used wasn't proper or the design wasn't actually faithfully implemented in manufacturing. And then you have to go and tweak and then you got to fail and fail and fail again until you get to a point where everything's working how you intended it to work or how you wanted it to work in the beginning. And uh, then hopefully your product is is uh, is ready to release. Hmm. I love how you you treat failure as a milestone, like a, a stage that you have to get to before you can uh, go beyond and continue to improve the product. I think uh, where a lot of entrepreneurs, especially newer ones, trip up is that once they hit that first failure, they think that that's it. This this path is closed off. Let's go do something else. But you use it as a way to to reach the next level that's beyond the failure. So when you are trying to get things to fail as quickly as possible, can you give examples of what you're, I guess, throwing the product against to 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 uh, make almost like a, what's the filter that you use to determine if if something's going to pass or not, especially early on? Because it sounds like manufacturing is a certain stage, and there's user testing that's important to make sure that that uh, it's not it's not a uh, failing in the way that. A, normal user would use it. Are there even things even earlier to determine whether it's actually even a product that people want? Um, usually we don't fail. 
I, I guess I don't see the failure process on the early stages, kind of the, the idea, the, the concept, the design process. Um, because failure in that stage is, you know, we see three or four different uh, ideas on in a drawing, just a sketch. We kind of analyze them. We pick them apart. We see, oh, that could cause, you know, longevity issues or this isn't as easy as I think it needs to be. Um, the failure really happens when we start iterating in the prototyping stages and definitely in the manufacturing stages. And uh, when you said, is there something we throw it at, if we literally throw it at the wall or the ground, you know, we're trying <laughs> to break it. We're trying to find uh -huh. the weak points um, that we do. But we also go out in the field and we use it as, as a photographer would. And uh, so this product launch we're about to you know, finalize has involved uh, multiple different kind of photo shoots. You know, back in October, we were really prepping to, to launch it in the very beginning of, of this year in January. And uh, so we flew some influencers out to, to Tucson and we wanted to start making our Kickstarter campaign video. And uh, where we were using it, um, we, we saw some problems that, that needed to be corrected. And those were just things we hadn't actually gone out too much into the field ourselves to test them. And we felt really confident because we had been working on these for, for six months. And when we went out in the field and actually use it like a human uh, as a photographer, that's when you get to see different ways that the product the product is going to be used. And it allowed us an opportunity to then continue honing and perfecting it. And uh, our design team tells us that, like, yeah, we're going the extra mile for sure um, that we, we feel like this is a version four product without having ver released versions one through three because of the ways we've progressed um, because we've had manufactured products in our hands and now we need to just make them fail and see if they're going to work reliably in every situation we do it at. Uh, so it's definitely the failure comes, comes more in the physical manufacturing, mm -hmm. the prototyping stage and less in the ideas because we, you know, we're not afraid of throwing out good ideas. Um, and that's actually something else. Uh, I think uh, Tim Cook even said, the, the, predator, the successor to Steve Jobs, that Apple is just as proud of the things that they say no to as they are the things that they say yes to. The products that they do release are just as important to them as the ones that they never even pursue because they want to stay focused on making sure they have the best products available. And so when we put stuff on the table for design, uh, we're not holding back. You know, We want to get the best product and the best user experience. And uh, we just go back and forth until we, we agree like, yeah, this, this feels like it's it. Let's start uh, you know, with 3D printing and uh, prototyping and test them out. See if we get that proof of concept. You know, we have the idea. Does that idea even work? And so we'll make a proof of concept. And if that works, then we'll start refining until we get to a little more refined prototype. We'll test that out. We'll refine and refine and refine until we feel like, all right, we've gotten to a point where we think we need to take it in manufacturing, get them to make it in the, in the materials that need to be made in so we can actually do that final testing. Mm. So you mentioned this a couple of times. It sounds like a, a theme within the the way that in your your philosophy on business, which is around focus, around throwing out good ideas to make sure you focus on the great ideas. You talk about solving just one problem with one product rather than just stuffing with features. I can't imagine that that uh, a whole team can have this mentality just in, innately. Can you talk to us about? This like did you develop this talent or did you develop this talent within the team to be more like a self policing around how to really focus on solving just one thing? Uh, yeah, it's it's been a, <laughs> a heck of a journey. You know, we're only four and a half years young, I guess, and that's uh, that's pretty young um, in in business world. But um, you know, it was a very you know it was myself in the very beginning, and then. Slowly, I, I learned how to start bringing in people that uh, possessed values that you know ind indicated that they'd be people that I wanted to work around and wanted to be passionate about the brand. Um, but it, it was definitely you know we're tripping over ourselves uh, because of how quickly we've grown. Um, it was it was a struggle for the first few years, and uh, about the th just before four years in, we were about a team of ten. And staying focused was something really hard to do. And it's it's contrary to my natural way of thinking. 
like I said, I'm, I'm kind of classified as a visionary. And the more you learn about your personality through like a Myers-Briggs test or different the aptitude and skills tests, I learned a lot about that visionary personality. And it's that I get bored really quickly with things we've been working on previously. And I'm always jumping for those shiny things like, oh, that sounds really cool. Let's do this. And so I had to really you know, restrict myself and challenge myself and actually invite my coworkers to challenge me um, to help us stay focused. But it was still something incredibly hard to do. But um, there was a book I read called Traction by Gina Wickman. And uh, he proposes a business philosophy in really just pragmatic way on how to approach growing a business. And Traction is all about how to gain focus on uh, on your business, on your marketing, on your goals, your vision, where you're going in the future, and then present some tools that allow you to build traction over time. And that traction is kind of interpreted in the book like a flywheel. Once you start turning that heavy wheel, that inertia, you're going to build and build and build until it's starting to really pick up speed. And as long as you're kind of following um, a well thought out process and you're following it faithfully, that that traction will kind of contain that momentum and uh, that inertia will just allow you to go faster and faster. And so this, this ability to focus is, I guess, fairly recent for us, but has been pretty life changing for me and for our team, because we're now getting to the point where the rest of the team can identify like, yeah, this is a good thing, but it's not the best thing. And so right now we're all kind of 100% focused on launching these new products. And that means we get marketing opportunities, conferences, influencers that have really cool workshops, other kind of uh, industry partners that want to do podcasts or email newsletters and cross collaborate. And it's really hard to say, sorry, we can't do that right now. We know what our resources are and we're focusing a hundred percent on making sure we nail this product launch a hundred percent on time and exactly how we want it to be. And so that ability to focus really teaches you um, what's important in your business and what's important um to, to focus on. And if you don't have focus, if, if everything's important, then nothing's important. And so that's been a really difficult thing for us. And we're getting much better in the, the product development team to know how to maintain that focus and, uh, and really focus on our goals because we know what our, our one year, three year and 10 year goals look like. Mm. Yeah, that accountability, I think, is is what's worked really well for you guys, where you have a team that you tell them to hold you accountable to to these standards. And so I think it's sometimes easy for us to forgive ourselves when it's something that we are innately drawn towards, right? I think a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of creative types will be just like you, where they can get bored with things that they're working on. They want to move on to the next uh, thing that they've thought of, right? So I think that accountability is important. And if you don't have a team, I think that's why, you know, accountability partners or mastermind, some other kind of group that you can rely on to to help them tell you to, or to basically keep you in check is important. So it sounds like you have a lot of kind of business role models. You mentioned Steve Jobs, Tim Cook, and you mentioned a book, uh, track, the Traction book. Are there any other books that you have read that have had a big impact on how you run your business? Uh, maybe not a big impact on how I, I've been running it, but we'll have a big impact going forward. Um, I'm, I've always been inter- interested in the entrepreneuring side of business rather than the operational side. So as a photographer, I enjoyed photography and I got pretty good at it, but I was really kind of geeked out by, by growing a business. And eventually I, I kind of capped myself as a solopreneur and needed something new. And that's where Magmod kind of came in. But uh, going forward, uh, books, there's one book called Good to Great by Jim Collins talks about how why some companies over a very long period of time became really great companies and and why you know what were the characteristics the leader needed to possess to allow it to become a great company what were the disciplines and focuses that uh, the business had to have in order to become great and then a follow-up book to that um, same series of books there's built to last and there's good to great and then there's great by choice is another um, kind of research analysis on great companies that uh, were able to thrive and grow amid 
very difficult circumstances, kind of the environment around them in the world, in business, was uh, not good for them, but they were allowed to, or they were able to excel despite those circumstances. And why the competitors failed in those same circumstances. And so they kind of de- debunked the myth that uh, some businesses just get lucky um, when that's really actually not the case. It was more about the disciplines that, that the leaders or the businesses possessed that allowed them to thrive. Companies in that book like Microsoft, Intel, Southwest Airlines, um, other companies like that. And so those those will have a great impact on me going forward. Uh, one of my recent books that I just finished uh, two weeks ago was uh, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. And uh, that goes through how to really build a great cohesive team that allows you to, to really focus on the results. And there's kind of five foundational steps to, to getting to where results are the most important thing across your entire team. Fantastic book. So if you have a, a team of people, that's uh, really changed how, I've, how I kind of view that. Um, and I, you know, I have local mentors, uh, people in business that I look up to tremendously that have been down this road before that, uh, I just, I love talking with them. I love uh, asking them questions and learning from them. I think that's one thing. If you're a, a younger entrepreneur, not by age, but by experience, um, go talk with people, go find a networking group. Um, and don't be afraid to, to reach out and ask questions. I think uh, most entrepreneurs, are, are eager to, to kind of pass on their knowledge um, as long as you're polite and courteous and respectful of their time. I think most people want to, to help others. And uh, I love being able to answer questions if I can. If I have any level of expertise that would benefit someone, I'd be, I'd be happy to share it. Mm-hmm. And so that was something I, I learned early on. You know, I, I started my photography company when I was 21 and eventually went full time by 23. And I've kind of worked for myself ever since was you have to learn how to ask for help sometimes. And uh, sometimes that kind of goes against the entrepreneur mindset. Like, no, I got to I gotta figure this Do out. yourself, yeah. And sometimes you just got to ask people who have been there before you for that, that wisdom and that expertise and, and take it for what it's worth. You don't necessarily need to go and jump and do exactly as they said. But uh, the more sources you can collect information from, the more you can then filter what are the really – solid principles that I need to be basing my decisions off of or tr- stack tr- uh, strategies or tactics and, you know, get a lot of information before you actually start making decisions. And once you do, then, uh, then I think you're better off. So yeah, reach out mm-hmm. and ask for help for sure. Yeah. I think this kind of uh, live feedback from some kind of meetup or some kind of gathering of other business, uh, business owners is, uh, even more beneficial th- than books a lot of times because the knowledge is a little bit more accustomed to your particular situation because you're asking someone and you're telling them about your, your business and, and your, your, the problems that you're facing. Where, where have you been able to find these uh, gatherings or meetings? What do you recommend people go check out? If they want to start being a, more a part of that community. You know, that's that's a great question. I, I'm actually in that process trying to get myself a little more out of the business on the on the week to week so I can go out and, and meet and commune with other successful business owners and leaders so I can kind of learn more about how they were successful. Um, so I'm kind of actively uh, looking for those things. I think there's you know some great Facebook groups that I'm part of that are you know in the photo industry, other business owners that can share their wisdom on how they've been marketing or how they've been building products. There's groups like uh, EO and Vistage. Um, I'm not members of those. I'm I'm looking at uh, probably joining one of them this year that uh, allow you to be in a forum where you have other like-minded business owners in your community and you talk about the different issues that you face. And um, yeah, those are all some of the great ways. There's different conferences uh, I'm going to a conference this week, um, which is actually part of the Traction kind of ecosystem. It's called the Traction Conference, where I can kind of network with other people that are in the same shoes, other visionaries, other uh, other business owners, other uh, mid-managers that are following this philosophy of EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. And uh, the more you can network and ask questions, I think uh, that, that, that at least that's how I learn quickly, is if I can learn from someone else's mistakes, then then even better. 
Mm-hmm. I think in your situation, you have, you've mentioned you have mentors, but you're obviously not in a position where you can be a mentor to someone else and you probably have been already. And I think that there has been a lot of uh, entrepreneurship advice out there to go and find a mentor. And you'll see a lot of people go out and you know, they'll start going around to find people and say, will you be my mentor? Can you be my mentor? And this approach, I don't think works very well where you're just going out asking people to 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 be your mentor. Based on your experience, so now, now I think on both sides, like what, what have you found effective in terms of developing, finding a mentor and developing a relationship with them so that they are yeah, actually, that is actually beneficial on both sides? Um, well, I do have a few specific mentors that I will talk with and, and meet with regularly. Uh, one of them is, is someone I pay. And so it allows me to kind of reserve a time on their calendar um, to get constant feedback. And uh, so a lot of mentors can can be free. Uh, take them out to lunch, you know, send them some gifts, make, make them sh- make, make sure that they know that you value their time um, because of the, the ability that they have to help you is is pretty tremendous if they've kind of been in your shoes before. Um, so I would recommend, yeah, find someone. And, and if there's someone that does it professionally, um, those are never bad. Um, I, so I've, I've experienced both ways. But I think in order to find that person, you have to be involved in your community in some way. And so a lot of the people I know and, and meet with are, are just acquaintances I've run into in business meetings or conferences or seminars. And uh, you just have to be willing to kind of put yourself out there and find those people and nurture that relationship so that you, you could call upon them when you when you are stuck in a bind and you need some advice or you need some help and they can probably give you five minutes of information that allows you to solve a month's long problem that you've been battling with for, mm. for quite a while. Mm-hmm. So speaking of groups, uh, you mentioned earlier about the Facebook group, the community that you have uh, built. Uh, I, t- I took a look at it. I think there's 30,000 or over 38,000 members now. How, how was this? Uh, what was the purpose behind starting a group like this? I think people naturally like to be involved in a community that has similar interests, you know, hobbyist groups, car groups, you know, those have been around for, for decades and Facebook, you know, their, their mission, I guess, was to allow people to come together, build communities. And so when we started the Facebook community, I believe it was early or mid 2015, and uh, it allowed a place for people to come and talk about Magmon, uh, a place where anyone in there is likely interested in the products and people wanted to get advice on how they get the results that others are getting out of them um, and talk about different lighting and, and photography in general. And uh, it's become a, a pretty, I guess, recognized group in the photo industry as, as one of the better groups to go and feel inspired uh, we do a pretty decent job of of managing kind of uh, some rules that are are very logical. You know, we don't we don't allow buying and selling and and other non photography related discussion in there because we want people to feel like they can come here in the Magmod community on Facebook and really learn how to be a better photographer and how to get the most out of the products that we offer because that's our mission. We want to make awesome photography easy, and we just happen to do it right now through small speed light modifiers. And so the more we can promote that mission, the better. And so the Facebook community was was a pretty natural thing for us to do. And uh, it, it grew at a pretty decent pace in the very beginning. And then about six months in, it was just starting to, to take off um, pretty, pretty well. And now we're, I guess it sounds like 38,000 members. Mm-hmm. Um, it's continued to grow very, very quickly. And it's because there's a lot of people in there every day sharing great photography and talking about how they made it. And uh, the more people feel like they can get that information, uh, especially free, then I think and then they want to be part of that community. They want to learn and they want to contribute to the success of that community as well. Yeah, 38,000 members is already impressive. But I think what's even more impressive is, is that it's around a particular company or brand, which I usually don't see, or even a particular product, which I usually don't see where where most groups are centered around maybe something more, uh, I guess, generic, like just like photography or photography lighting. But yours seems to be centered around the products that you offer, which obviously is great for, for your business. Or what have you done to, to encourage, I guess, engagement? I, I'm assuming there's a limit to how much someone can talk about a particular product. So you probably have to expand the, 
kind of content that's being shared uh, in that group. And it sounds like people sharing photog- photographs that they've taken is, is one thing. Are there other sorts of types of content that you try to encourage in that group? You know, we don't have to encourage much. The The community is is uh, is pretty awesome. There's people that go in there and love to share tips and tricks. Um, some of our, our VIPs and ambassadors, they love to share different images that they've been creating on, on in their professional life. And then uh, there's people that just ask questions about general lighting, like which which flash works with, with camera or which which modifiers give the best results for this type of situation. Um, so we're not necessarily actively requesting types of, of you know, enge- uh, feedback or content. It's just people are naturally going in there and sharing really, really good content. We do have, uh, I think it, it used to be monthly. I don't know if there's any specific time frame on it. Uh, but one of our kind of our influencer managers, Trevor Daly, is a very well-known photographer. He lives here in Arizona. And uh, he, he commutes into Tucson uh, regularly to come work with us as a team. Um, but he reaches out to a lot of um, our, our big fans, our, our influencers in the industry and the community. And he kind of does um, a behind-the-scenes type of uh, video, live live Facebook video, where, you know, very much like this podcast, he's just asking questions on really cool photographs that that photo- photographer made and asking them to walk through how they made that and why they did that. And so it kind of gives that behind the scenes insight into a, into a photograph that uh, normally would be really hard to do in just describing it um, in a Facebook post. We actually get to hear the, the, the story behind it. And so those are always you know, some of the highest watched videos in, in, in our group is those um, you know, how I shot it videos is what we call them. Yeah, I like that a lot. I'm not a, a professional photographer or anything, but I've, I've been in those communities where it's a lot of times people just drop in a photo and then kind of just leave, right? And not explain the creative process behind the scenes like you're talking about. But if you are a big into photography, that's the thing you want to learn the most. Like, how do I replicate that? How can I create that style within my own photography? So I think that's a great idea to be able to bring on uh, essentially an expert on using your product or using products like yours and then getting them to explain how to use it. Because I think it, that can apply in, in any industry, in any business where you can find someone that is is a pro at using your product and get them to explain how they, they're using it in their, in their day-to-day craft. Um, so with the, with the group this large, and you mentioned that it's kind of just uh, organic and I think one of the challenges when it's uh, organic and uh, lots of uh, engagement as well is that there's going to be more difficulty in moderation and managing all of it, especially as it has grown from you know a few thousand to now almost forty thousand members. What, what's the what's the process there? How do you make sure that everything is essentially under control in that group? Well, I have to credit my team. We have a, a great group of people on our team that uh, really takes this uh, seriously. We want to we wanna foster a community where everyone is welcome and we want to foster a specific type of uh, community where people can share images and, and learn from it and contribute and build up the community and, and, and just grow as photographers. We want to make awesome photography easy and the better we can do that, um, awesome. Got it. One thing you mentioned before was, or in the pre-interview was that that you recommend entrepreneurs set bigger goals than you think you're capable of now. You set the sky's the limit, so keep stretching higher and higher, and if you stay focused, you'll achieve it. What was your goal early on, and in, in what looking back on it, what what could you have set it to instead? Yeah, I think uh, I think as as entrepreneurs, we're capable of more than we realize, and as we get into the nitty gritty of executing the strategy that we have in our head. Um, we have to play both visionary and both an integrator. We have to take that strategy and make it work. But first, we have to dream that strategy. And sometimes um, I, I get stuck, not necessarily stuck, but I have to be realistic. And so it's like I got this big dream, but it doesn't seem realistic right now. So I'm going to take those first few steps. I think making sure that you constantly reevaluate that dream is uh, kind of what I was getting at, that sometimes we set that goal, but the pie in the sky, 
And then we're 80% there and we realize, wow, I got, I got here quicker than I realized. And that's been something I've learned is set the goal higher. Um, if you've proven that you've been able to execute on a strategy time and time again, over two or three or four years, set that next goal even higher because the likelihood of you realizing how much you've accomplished so far will likely push you to believe like I can get that. And so I've, I've just learned that we've set um, either product goals or revenue goals. And those are, are kind of uh, indicators that, that reflect past performance. But if I set that goal high enough, it, it'll allow me to chase something with maybe a little more passion than realizing, yeah, I can do this. I got this. And I won't put maybe as much energy into that project rather than if it was something a little outside of my comfort zone a little beyond what I thought was capable, it's just going to fuel me that much, that much further. So I would say, yeah, set a goal that is realistic, but set something that's a pie in the sky. Go out there and achieve something really awesome because I think as entrepreneurs, we're capable of it. Mm. Can you give us an idea of how large you've grown the business in, in the last four years? Yeah, so our first Kickstarter campaign, where we raised $210,000 in about 30 days. And that was definitely more than I thought we'd get in the first 30 days. The campaign goal was to reach 35,000. And that was a number that I knew would take to uh, make an initial order with our suppliers, uh, fulfill that demand, and give us a little bit to put on the shelves to continue selling uh, on our website. And we reached that 35,000 in five hours. And that was just, I think having a product that sold itself. Um, there wasn't any anything necessarily genius that I did to get the word out. You know, I had some great friends that spread the word and then it just picked up like wildfire. And so we did 210,000 that first 30 days. And then by the end of the first year, it was, it was just over half a million. And uh, we've grown, grown 200% year over year since then. And so uh, we're growing very, very quickly and sometimes it's really hard to kind of keep up with the demand uh, because we've had to grow in our staff. Uh, we're almost 20 now, and that's uh, that's not easy to do. Uh, but now we're, we're set to continue doubling every single year for the next two or three years based on what we see in our product lineup and how the brand is growing globally. Very cool. So MagMod, which is at magnetmod.com. Thank you again so much for your time, Spencer. Thank you, Felix. Enjoyed it. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Shopify Masters, the e-commerce podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs powered by Shopify. To get your exclusive 30-day extended trial, visit shopify.com masters.